Good morning. This is Max Adek, Mr. Diva Bedek, and we're back with another great webinar sponsored by Clinic Labs today. It's all about healthy entertaining, and not only do I have my additional co-host here with me, Brian, from Clinic Labs, but I also have a special guest star today, Brian. She's on my Diva Talk radio show every month with me. She's, I call her one of the Charlie's Angels in Outreach. Wow. Her name is Judy Wilcox and she's a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator from Hollywood, Florida. Hello, Judy. Hi, Max. Hi, Mr. Divabatic. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, Judy. Well, you know, today, uh, Brian and Judy, we're going to be talking about healthy entertaining because one of the biggest topics I feel people are dealing with with diabetes is food. So we wanted to approach it from a new angle, but also cover some of the basics. And then we know that the holidays are quickly approaching. So it's important for people when they're going to parties to know not only if they're throwing them but attending them, how they could still stay healthy and upbeat about their care. So that's kind of the theme for today's webinar. And if you're with us live, feel free to send us questions throughout the presentation. Judy uh, will be talking a little bit, little bit later about how to go to a, one of your favorite restaurants and helping guide us through the menu. Brian's going to be talking about the basics in diabetes, food, breaking down proteins, fats, lipids, and uh, carbohydrates. And then I've got my top 10 healthy, entertaining tips that I'm going to give out today, too. So feel free to chat with us live. Send me your questions. We want to hear from you. And uh, we're going to kick things off because a lot of people have misconceptions about food and diabetes. Is there such a thing as a diabetic diet, Judy? Not really. Most diets, um, well, when I think of the word diet, I actually take the T off and call it die. So I like to think of individualizing a meal plan for the person that works with their lifestyle. And are you, is that what you do as a registered dietitian? You kind of sit down with someone and um, uh, walk us through a little bit of that. Well, when someone comes to see me, I like to sit with that person and get to know them a little bit and find out what they do, what their lifestyle is like, a little bit about what their work day is like, to find out what their food preferences are, do they have any other health problems. So we could do, so we're partners in designing a meal plan together. So it's something that as a person living with diabetes, you could use as part of your lifestyle. And is it fair to assume that if you were throwing a party, would you be, and I wanted to, if, if I was living with diabetes and I wanted to throw a party, would you be making me go much more basic than fabulous, or would you be able to work with me and help me kind of put in some of my favorite things? Like, I do enjoy my soul food and macaroni and cheese. Is that something you would take off my menu, or would you help me put it on my menu in a, in a new way? We want to include the foods you like because then you're going to stick with it. And, of course, when you're making a party, it can be fit and fabulous at the same time. So I think it's really important that you include some of the things you like so you don't feel deprived and you can still have some of the foods you love just in smaller portions. Now, I would love to hear, and Brian would too, if people agree or disagree with that comment, please send in your chat. Uh, chat with us right now. Let me know if you have a food uh, item that you don't think a registered dietitian will help you manage. And I think we'll challenge you today, Judy, to see if someone has a question about food. And if you could, on, uh, right off the top of your head, help them begin to manage that back into a healthy diet. Well, I'll take that channel. I'll take that challenge, Matt. All right. So, well, we're going to so go right into Life's a party, so we're going to be dealing with highs and lows because we know that's the part. Uh, well, first, I guess we're going to start with nutrition basics, Brian, and, and work with you and just talk about sure. food in general. Then we'll get into the highs and lows as well as healthy tips and Judy talking us through the restaurant. Okay. So so anybody who hasn't heard me before, uh, my name is Brian, uh, Brian Pondrath, and I'm a nurse practitioner here at Clinical Labs. And I must say, I'm a little nervous. Uh, Judy is probably much, much smarter when it comes to uh, nutrition and diet and everything I'm about to talk to. So I know that if there's anything I screw up, Judy, you be sure and call me out on it right away, okay? All right, Brian, we're a team. We're, we're uh, just the part, and it's just the basics. <laughs> so there's really... Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. And especially in diabetes, the very first one that we're always going to, or that, that, that we're looking at the most is carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrates, um, the first thing that probably comes to mind is bread. 
Um, and not all carbohydrates are bad. Uh, this is something that gets demonized. You, you always you hear the low-carb diets and the no-carb diets and the no bread, no muffins. Uh, carbohydrates are an essential source of fuel in your body. Uh, that that it, it's not really a sustainable path to never eat carbohydrates. So like everything else, in moderation, carbs are, are good for you. Carbs are actually the main source of uh, fast fuel uh, in your body, and they're oxidized um, in your body, which is actually the same process as rust. Um, I don't know why I even said that, but... Um, there might be some carb lovers in the class today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, excess carbohydrates uh, are stored uh, in your body uh, as glycogen, uh, which might sound familiar. It, it's, it's the same root as glucose. So carbohydrates are, are structurally the closest thing you're going to eat to pure glucose. Uh, one other thing I want, I'm going to bring up for each, uh, each one of these groups and that I had a little picture for, but unfortunately it didn't transfer over in my slides is that if you took a like amount of, of all four groups, so if you took a little pile of carbohydrates and a little pile of protein, a little pile of fat, and a little, I guess you can have a pile of alcohol, but a little glass of alcohol, that they have different amounts of energy uh, in each pile. For the same weight, you get a different amount of energy in each one. And energy is actually the exact same thing as calories. All calories is, is a dietary word that dietitians use uh, to measure energy. And carbohydrates have four calories per gram. Uh, so the good sources uh, of carbohydrates, obviously, you've heard things like whole grains. We love whole grains, uh, at least nurse practitioners do. I don't know about Judy, but I, oh, I'm guessing I get a second like on that one. Oh, we whole grains. Oh, definitely. More brown rice, whole grain bread. That slows down the rise of the blood sugar, so I think that's really important. To why is to that? Is that because there's more fiber that you both like whole grains, or uh, why do you like that? Um, because there's more fiber in it, it takes longer to digest, and it slows down how fast it's going to move through your stomach and through your digestive system. So you retain that food, and you feel full a little bit longer. It also helps with digestion and prevents constipation, and, and they're just better for you. It's a part of the food that helps um, your body digest it. All right, so are all carbohydrates created equal? Absolutely not. Judy, all carbohydrates created equal? Not all carbohydrates are created equal because some of them have been processed. So I like to think of it as processed and unprocessed food because the more processed it is, the less fiber it has. More of the vitamins and minerals have been stripped away from the food. So choosing more things in their natural form is going to make them be higher in fiber. And also, you know, the process, it's your body, you can think of it like this. When you eat a slice of white bread, um, your body takes it in and instantly converts it to sugar. I mean, right away within, well, I don't know exactly in minutes. Nobody can tell you exactly, but a matter of minutes. Rather quickly. Rather quickly. We can put it that way. And when you eat a slice of whole wheat bread, your body takes it in and then has to process it itself. Your body, your stomach, uh, and your intestines have to digest it before that it can release those those calories and that sugar into your bloodstream. Uh, and it's that processing and it's that slow release that is so beneficial for diabetics. And Judy, we're getting a question regarding sugar. Is brown sugar healthier for you than white sugar? Uh, brown sugar is just sugar, regular white sugar that has not had the molasses removed from it. So it's really the same, equal amounts of calories and carbohydrates in both sugars and will cause the same rise in blood sugar. Okay. And Brian, I guess we're going on to protein. Yeah, so protein, very important. Um, protein is the function in the body, I'll just read a little bit, is uh, what helps you build and rebuild cells. Uh, when, when I create a diet for uh, somebody who has had surgery or a burn injury, uh, protein is incredibly important because it helps you rebuild tissues. 
for people with diabetes, it's not like you've had a burn injury, but uh, it is very important to maintain uh, healthy cell structures, healthy uh, vascular tissue, and protein is incredibly important for that. Protein, weight for weight, has the same amount of energy in it as carbohydrates. Uh, there's four calories per gram of protein. So when you're counting uh, what you eat and you're looking at, oh, well, I had, you know, four ounces of red meat and I had four ounces of whatever, you can say that you had the same amount of calories from protein and carbohydrates. So what we really like, uh, proteins obviously come from meat is the main source. You can get um, protein from dairy products. And you can actually get a simple protein by eating a, a, a combination of uh, rice and beans. That's what uh, most of the rest of the world, besides the United States, gets their protein from. Um, but we're looking for lean protein. Um, you know, it's very easy to mask a whole lot of fat when you eat uh, red meat. Uh, so we're looking for that lean chicken, lean fish. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm not telling you to cut out all red meat from your diet, but like everything else, moderation is the key. Well, and there's a appears to be a vegetarian in Kansas who has a question about proteins. Are so is soy and tofu considered proteins, Brian or Judy? Yes. Oh my God, that's Judy. <laughs> yeah, soy and um, tofu are considered a vegetarian source of protein, which is a really lean, good source that contains a lot of anti antioxidants and you could get as a vegetarian you can get plenty of protein from the vegetables you eat by adding tofu by adding soybeans because and, and it really is a great lean choice but now you know we're talking about entertaining and I know one of the things people like to put on the table more than anything when they're entertaining is cheese is cheese a form of protein Yes, cheese is a form of protein. But is that an excuse to ladle the cheese on the uh, on the buffet table? I don't think so, right, Judy? Well, I think it could be an accompaniment, like a small piece of cheese, or like if you shred some cheese on top of something, it could add a lot of flavor. Or if you took like some low-fat cheese, like part skin mozzarella, and put it on something, and then tossed on just a little bit of cheddar, everything would grab that wonderful flavor so that you could add a little bit of cheese. Just try to pick cheese that's lower in fat, and um, you could add a little tiny bit, because cheese is an animal product, and it contains cholesterol and saturated fat, as most animal products are the ones that contain cholesterol. And some cheeses are also high in sodium, are they not? Yes. Cheese, cheese is, a, is a strong source of sodium because it's processed. And a lot of foods that are processed, just as similar as lunch meat, small luncheon meats would be very, very high in sodium. Like uh, they're always advertising, you know, having sandwiches. But when you look at the sodium content, it's probably between 1,000 and 1,800 milligrams of sodium in a sandwich you might get eating out at your favorite sub place. I don't know if Jared's aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> did, did Jared know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're going <laughs> to thank you, Judy, for that clarification. We're moving on to fats and oils, Brian. Okay. So First fats category. and oils. Delicious fat and oil. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is my favorite one when we do the EEVO. <laughs> exactly. So oh, Rachel, Ray, but her, is, are there a lot of calories in that? I'm just curious. Are there How many calories are in a tablespoon of that? Uh, uh, extra virgin oil? About 150 because a teaspoon is 50 calories and 5 grams of fat. So, so when, when you're she's on the Food Network and she's just sliding that around the, the pan, I mean she's dumping in about 250, 300 calories right off the bat, right? Right there, right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And people think that's glamorous and it is glamorous and effective, but just measure it next time. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, so fat, um, Fat has nine calories per gram, and not all fats are created equal. Um, one of the biggest things lately, uh, I'd say in the last five years, has been trans fat. Um, that's always a big, you know, key, you know, kind of zing word, uh, and it's true. Um, if you ever read on the back, uh, you know, in the when you're reading the ingredients, 
uh, and you read partially hydrogenated uh, either vegetable oil or soybean oil or uh, whatever it is, that's trans fat. Uh, and those are particularly um, bad for you. Uh, you're not going to be able to avoid all of it, and one little drop isn't going to kill you, uh, but it's certainly something you want to keep an eye on uh, and do your best to avoid. Uh, yeah, fats I, are, oh, go know, ahead. Brian, Brian, I think it's really important to, to remind people that the fat intake is important because of the relationship of diabetes and heart disease, and, oh, yeah. and lowering the fat content of the diet is really, really important. So it's important to have a certain amount of fat, but you know, trying to stay away from fried foods, greasier foods. So if you're entertaining, you might want to do more baked or grilled things. Certainly. certainly. Now, I find fat also an issue of confusion because I know this happened. We were talking about this, I believe, on our Diva Talk radio once, Judy, about someone go, that we, we're going to do a dining out with a dietitian that's coming up in this webinar. But one of the places we were talking about going to the Cheesecake Factory, if I sat down and I checked my blood glucose before the cheesecake and then I ordered the cheesecake and I ate it, because of the amount of fat in the cheesecake, if I then check my blood glucose, I might not see any change, correct? You might not see a change for a little while because it takes longer to digest fat because so there's then, so much more nutrient dense. Right, so then people might think like, oh, cheesecake doesn't affect my blood glucose, but then several hours later after I've digested the fat, I might see, you might see what's happening to your blood glucose. You might see it go up, and then a couple hours later you may see it go up again, so it might go up twice. It might go up two, because when you, after you eat, you know, you want to check your blood sugars about an hour to an hour and a half after you eat. So, you know, if you check them, you might see it go up a little bit, but if you check about three hours later, it might go up because of the high fat content of that meal. And there are people who just don't make that association between the fat, that there's some fats in those foods and think that that becomes a safe food. So it's good to, to have a little bit of understanding about this. Right. I think it is really important because then they'll check later on and they go, well, why did my sugar go up all of a sudden? I don't understand that, you know, because I didn't eat anything and all of a sudden their sugar went up and it's, catch it's kind of catching up. It's like playing catch up. Well, and, you know, we're talking about healthy, entertaining, and uh, most parties I know always serve some kind of beverage. So we wanted to include this today uh, because we just wanted to, to talk to people from the standpoint that they might be having a cocktail or two at a, uh, a function. Um, so, Brian, let, tell us a little bit about alcohol and diabetes and how they work together. Certainly. So I had the, the, the three slides I had before were carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and they were really nice. They were all standardized. And I could have made another one, um, but I thought uh, I would ask, just think for a minute, uh, if we said that carbohydrates have four calories per gram and protein has four calories per gram and fat or oil has nine calories per gram, I want you to think, how many calories do you think that alcohol has per gram? And I, I'm just going to let you think about it for a, a few seconds, and then I'll tell you. Alcohol has seven calories per gram. So it's not quite as much as fat, but alcohol, not even the sugary mix that you put alcohol with, uh, but just the pure alcohol in a drink has seven calories per gram. Uh, so an ounce, if anybody remembers back to their basic chemistry days, an ounce is actually uh, 28 grams, maybe 30 grams. It's like 28 something, 28.6 or 28.7 grams. So one ounce, one, it's actually most shots you get are two ounces, but one small uh, shot glass full of alcohol uh, is basically 30 times 7, uh, 3 times 7 is 200, it's 210, maybe 220 calories uh, in one shot of alcohol. Uh, and most people don't really think about that. They think, oh, well, you know, I, if I just have a, if I, if I drink pure, you know, alcohol and I don't put any mix in it or it's not a cosmopolitan that it, you know, doesn't have any calories in it, but it actually has a huge amount of calories in it and it's in a very raw form. Um, your body, uh, you may as well just be eating table sugar. Now, that being said, I don't want to tell people that they can't drink at all. Um, 
like you said, uh, Judy, I, I love when you say that you take the tea off diet. You know, it's, it, what's the point of living on a diet if you can't live? So I actually took this little snippet right off of WebMD, uh, which I, I think is a good uh, resource to send people to. Um, but it says, use discretion when drinking alcohol if you have diabetes. Uh, alcohol is processed in a very similar way to the way fat is, uh, and then alcohol provides almost as many calories as fat. If you choose to drink alcohol, only drink it occasionally and when your blood sugar is well controlled. Uh, it's a good idea to check with your doctor uh, and make sure that drinking alcohol is acceptable. And there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. One, of course, is the calorie concern that I just talked about. But another one is, you, you know, alcohol might not be compatible with one of the medications you're taking. Uh, and it's always just a good idea to check with somebody else. Um, you know, I, I, I almost always talk to somebody else when I'm treating a patient, and I think it's always a good idea to have someone else talk to you or you talk to someone else. Uh, when you're making a big decision like that. So alcohol is acceptable, but of course never drink and drive and always drink in moderation. But you know, I just want to ask you this. I mean, a lot of people are not honest about their alcohol intake. So if they wanted to find out how a medication might uh, work with their, their um, al with an alcohol alcoholic beverage, can they go on WebMD or somewhere to find that out? Because I don't know if people would be comfortable addressing yeah. that with their doctor. You can literally, if you just type in into Google, alcohol and, uh, alcohol and, you know, in Metformin. Absolutely. You can type in Lipopage. alcohol and metformin. Uh, better to use the generic name if you can. So, glucophage is metformin. Um, and, you know, and, do a little you know bit of... Brian, what? I was going to throw something else at everybody, too, sure. is that when you drink, it's really important that you have a little small snack to eat with your alcohol because sometimes drinking alcohol can cause low blood sugars So it's because your body's going to process the alcohol. So it's good to have, like, maybe a handful of crackers. or That's why they put those little snacks on the bar, even though that's going to add more calories. But it, it's just a little tiny bit, but it's going to maybe give you some carbohydrates so you're not going to have that low blood sugar. Right. Well, now I'm confused because, Brian, you just said that alcohol was sugar, and, Judy, you're saying alcohol will lower my blood glucose. So how, how um, what's the best way to, go, what's the game plan for me if I'm, gonna, if I'm living with diabetes and I'm going to have a cocktail? Check your blood sugar. Prior to drinking? I would check it. You know, like if you're going to drive, I would definitely check it before you get in the car to drive and maybe check before you drink and then check after you drink to see how that reacts to you because it might be a little bit different for everybody. I, 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 I guess I should have put a caveat on what I said. The amount of calories in alcohol is, is very high, but as Judy was just saying, um, it takes a little bit of time, just like it takes a little bit of time for fat to, to, to be digested and turned into sugar inside your body. Uh, the same goes for alcohol. And like Judy's saying, when, you're, when your body gets that big surge of calories, uh, it's going to do whatever it can to uh, digest those calories, and it's going to, if it can, release insulin. Uh, and that surge of hormones, digestive enzymes, could actually lower your blood sugar before it's able to process the alcohol. Okay, and we have a question from West Palm Beach. I love having a margarita on Fridays. Judy, um, uh, because of the mixer and the margarita, do I need to have a snack with it, or will those calories help raise my blood, uh, raise my blood glucose? Well, I think I probably would have a small snack with it, and I might ask if they have a, um, a, a sugar free mixer or something because a lot of places are now offering that to people because it's like a margarita could have maybe 60 grams of carbohydrates in it. It could be a lot. So if you'd like to have that, I would have it, but I probably would have a small snack and I would definitely check my sugars. Do you have a website you like to recommend for people looking at mixed drinks or no as um, far as regarding their diabetes? Well, you could always look at, um, there's one that if you're looking for different menus and things, I think we had listed that as at healthfinder.com and always okay. calorieking.com. It always lists different beverages. 
But, you know, on the average, a glass of wine is probably about 100 calories and one carbohydrate choice. A mixed drink is going to really depend on the mixer. So what you might want to do is if you want to keep your calories in check is balance, you know, substitute one thing for something else. So, like, instead of having, you know, like, um, a, you know, if you're eating with a meal or something, you might cut back on your food a little bit and maybe have the mixer so you balance your calories, but have a little something, or maybe have nuts, which are more like a fat. Okay, and we're going to keep moving on because we're back in our party mode. Uh, oh, we're gonna boy. Come up with this, this is party lows we're dealing with right now because the idea is, like, not only as a guest but as a host or hostess, you want to be prepared for someone living with diabetes, and one of the things we were thinking about when we were planning the webinar was you're entertaining, you're mixing, you're, you're making beverages. Uh, apparently Judy is serving up the uh, appetizers next to us and suddenly someone goes low. So we're talking about how to be a good host or hostess with someone having a low. Uh, Brian, do you want to walk us through this? It's, sure. This is going to repeat in a couple of slides, so I might forward as you go because I know it's all going to be coming up again. No, that's fine. Um, so just so everyone knows, uh, I started off working in the medical ICU. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, taking care of people who had really acute uh, complications from their diabetes. Uh, that's where I started, actually. And uh, I also worked uh, for about a year and a half in uh, the emergency room at Columbia. So uh, I wanted just to touch very briefly on what to do, uh, let's say, like if you're at a party, and, you know, let's say you're, you know, Max and I are chatting and, you know, I walk, I'm going to the bathroom and I walk by the living room and there's somebody unconscious on the couch. Um, what should you do? The very first thing you should always do is don't just assume anything. You know, walk over, shake and shout, you know, so grab their shoulders and sort of don't do it too gently. I mean, you've got to actually try and wake the person up, but you also don't want to hurt them. So you're going to shake and you're going to yell at them and say, you know, if you know their name, hey, Max, uh -huh. how are you? Are you okay? Uh -huh. um, because, you know, maybe they just fell asleep. You know, right. God, God knows the last thing you want to do is call 911 on somebody who just fell asleep. Right. Um, but what if they don't? What if you shake and shout and try and say, how are you, and they don't do anything? Uh, that's, then that's you're going scary. right. So then you're going right into what? You're going to call 911. Okay, and then if but they, if they are uh, if they are responsive a little bit, you're serving liquid instead of a solid. I saw that with the orange right. on a previous slide. Right, right. It's actually on the bottom of the next slide. Um, if you if they're if they're sort of semi awake or um, you know they, they they wake up but they're real drowsy or they're sweaty and shaky and you know cold and clammy is the term we use in the hospital. Um, how do you know if they have low blood sugar or high blood sugar? And the answer is you really don't. Um, uh, everyone went, you know, the first thing I thought of when, when we were talking about drinks, you know, and having a drink was that it would raise your blood sugar right away. And then Judy made a great point that maybe it's actually low. Uh, and the, the answer, the, you know, the, real, the truth of the matter is unless you have a, a blood sugar machine at the ready to go right then and there, you don't know. And, and you can't make that assumption. So if they're if they're awake, but not you know fully with it, the best thing you can do is give them some juice. You know, especially you know orange juice or apple juice, because that is the single greatest source of sugar that you have uh, available. Especially if you're making drinks, you, you probably have like some pineapple juice or orange juice around as a as a little bit of mix. So you're always going to give them a little bit of juice because. It's much safer to give someone juice than it is to shove a candy bar in their face. Um, but we wouldn't use candy bars because chocolate has fat in it. It would slow down the absorption of blood glucose. That's so, right. So, all right. So now, Judy, walk us through. Uh, we're at a party. We're living with diabetes. We might be experiencing a low. Brian mentioned that some of us aren't carrying our blood glucose meters, but I know everyone on this webinar is. So I just found out I have I, – I know there's a rule. The rule of 15, right? That works for people yeah, who are 15, having Yeah, the 15 rule. It's like basically the 15-15 rule is a, a simple way to check your blood sugar immediately. 
and you want to see what the number is. And if the number is less than 70, then that's an emergency and you want to start treating. So you want to get really fast-acting carbohydrates. So if you didn't have juice, you could have something as simple as a packet of sugar or a teaspoon of sugar in a glass of water. Um, ideally, glucose tablets. Um, all of the divas should be carrying some glucose tablets or lifesavers with them or soda or a half a cup of milk, and you're going to check your blood sugar. You're going to wait about 15 minutes, and you're going to retest your sugar again and see if it comes up to 70. This is, you know, the, the way we treat it. If you didn't have a meter, like Brian said, it would be better to take a little juice. And um, you might notice if the person is sweaty or something like that. And, and once you, your blood sugar comes back up above 70, you want to have a little something to eat because those fasting carbs are going to come in and out, and you need to have something to hold you. Right. Now, that was a party low. Now we're going to talk about a party high. So here we are living with type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> we'll assume most of the people on our webinar are, but if you're living with type 1 and you want to ask us a question, please chat in like most of the attendees are right now. Or so please. here, how are we treating a high blood glucose? Judy? Oh, you're talking to me? Okay. So if you're um, to you were doing so glucose, good, I just thought I'd run with you for a minute. Keep going. Okay. For treating a high blood sugar, first thing I would want to make sure that I took my correct dosage of medication because especially for type 1s, you want, if your blood sugars are getting high, you want to be sure that you stay hydrated because it's really easy to go into a, a diabetic ketoacidosis. But you could start, if you checked your sugar and you checked your doses and you saw you were high and maybe you had been indulging a little bit at the party, you might want to start drinking some water. And, you know, drink plenty of water to try to see if your body starts eliminating um, the, the glucose, the sugar, by, you know, either you might feel a little sweaty, you might have to urinate, and then if your sugar comes down, that's fine. But if it doesn't come down, like, to less than 200, then I think it's important you call your doctor. So you could also start moving around. You could start dancing at the party. Exactly. That would, that would, that would help you start burning up some of that sugar. So dance, 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 and, you know, check, check, check. That's the most important thing. Well, and we always recommend in our, um, at our outreach programs, like we had one in Hollywood, Florida, that people find exercise they like. A lot of people do love to dance. You're at a party. You might as well use the dance floor exactly. as, a, as a way to, yeah, and uh, there you go. So, uh now let's go to the party, Brian and Judy. I'm picking you up in the car. I'm living with diabetes. I think people don't talk enough about driving with diabetes and some of the precautions. Uh, Brian, anything you want to say about driving in uh, living with diabetes and just being aware of the low blood sugar that could happen? Yeah, absolutely. So, And just for the record, before you begin, I'm sorry, there is such a thing as low uh, a low awareness of a low blood sugar, right? Like people hypoglycemic unawareness, yes. Sometimes you don't recognize those symptoms inside. Right. So we're not blaming anyone for going low in a car because we know that some people may have a low aware uh, unawareness as Judy just said. Yeah. So mm -hmm. always, you know, if you're going to be in the car for more than five minutes, you should you should test your blood sugar before you drive. Um, you sort of have to think for a minute about uh, what driving involves. And, you know, you could very well, you know, think that you're just going to be in the car for, you know, let's say 30 or 45 minutes, and then, boom, you hit a little bit of traffic, and before you know it, you're sitting there for two or three hours. Um, so check before you go. Uh, you know, as Judy said, any diva listening to this, this webinar, for a few dollars, you know, at the pharmacy, you can pick up some glucose tablets, uh, and those are really you know, a life, you know, <laughs> I know the next thing on those was lifesavers, but the glucose <laughs> tablets themselves can really be a lifesaver, especially if you find yourself, you know, you know that when you left your house, your blood sugar was, you know, 95, and you said, oh, you know, perfect, 95, I'm going out for dinner, I'll be there in 30 minutes, and then, you know, you hit a little traffic, or, you know, they give away your table, and you have to wait a little while, um, having those glucose tablets could really save your bacon. So, okay. Judy, did you have anything to add on that? I just think it's really important to check and to be aware that, you know, that, that drive 
gardening or travel. You know, the holidays also mean we might be traveling a little farther or, or going to take a plane somewhere. So I always like to bring this up, too. We might be flying to go visit a friend. So I think it's important that you always carry a snack and something with you. If you plan ahead, like even in your car, I tell people to keep little juice boxes, like packages of crackers with peanut butter, because, you know, those might not be your first choice, but if you're in that situation, it's something really simple or a cereal bar, throw it in your purse so you have something and you're prepared to try to help prevent a low. And uh, I think that's really important to check because how many times have, you know, do planes get stuck on the runway and you might not be able to get off and get something to eat. They don't give us any snacks, so. All right. Well, now we've covered dealing with lows at the party, highs at the party, going to the party. It's time to start throwing the party. And I've created a list of the top 10 healthy, entertaining tips for Brian and Judy to help me along here. I'm, I'm taking a note from David Letterman, and we're counting them down. My top 10, my number 10 tip, and if you've got a tip you want to share with us before we begin, please chat online with us. I know I'm going to get a couple tips on this because I just did a great program in Philadelphia, and the divas had a lot to say. So number 10, uh, put your spice based on ice. <laughs> this is a great tip to take those fresh herbs that you grow during the summertime, put them in the freezer, you hear that, use them all year long. I know I, maybe Florida doesn't have that problem, but we're already seeing the beginning of winter here in New York, Judy, so we have to, uh, this is a great way to just keep those flavors going uh, straight through the winter season. Actually, I just did that, Max. I just chopped down my basil plants already. I just took them all down, and I just put them all in the freezer. I just made some pesto and some different things with all those fresh herbs. And you know what else? You can just use them, and you can actually grow a little pot inside the house, too, if you wanted to. You mean you could grow some herbs in a pot? <laughs> Another <laughs> webinar, Judy. Number nine. We're moving meant. right along. <laughs> Oh, did that not come out? You can replace without losing taste. It is true. I mean, most people get really um, crazy and they feel like they can't give up the fat, they can't switch things, but you can really switch things out. And one of your great tips you had, Judy, was get rid of, um, try salsa instead of sour cream on a baked potato. I love that idea. It's really wonderful, and there's so many kinds of salsas you can make. You can make them with, you know, mango and cilantro, and you can add be black beans in them, so you add a little more fiber into the salsas, and, and they're very flavorful and fresh, and add a really great taste. So it helps replace a lot of the fat. And Number eight came from Orlando. My brother Rich is a uh, wonderful home chef, and he... Had, he was just, he just did Proud of the Pineapple for us in Hollywood, Florida, and his tip was they'll savor the, a nutty flavor because he thinks like if you just toast if you toast your nuts, you could add toasted nuts to anything, and it just perks up the flavor of everything you're cooking. So if you're broil, you know grilling chicken or you you know you're you're trying to cook healthy, that nuts will really pack in the flavor without packing in the fat or the or the calories. And they add a lot of crunch. I think that's important, a lot of crunch. Number seven, again from my brother in Orlando, Rich, uh, harness the power of a garnish. This is a great way to just dress up something that you might not think is the most appealing thing. Usually we all reach for the gooey, cheesy entree on the table. But in truth, if someone were to dress up a pineapple or watermelon or cantaloupe and make a really beautiful display, Judy, you could attest to this. People will grab it, correct? Oh, people definitely will gravitate to anything that looks good and delicious. If you make something interesting looking, you know, because I used to work as a food stylist, so That's by right. making that plate look really appealing, you could do that every single day at home, too, not just at a party, because, you, you know, every day should be a party. But I think it's really important. And you could buy, like, edible flowers. You can use herbs to garnish things, and then they're edible. Or even I've been seeing a lot of variety of different kinds of sprouts, like sunflower sprouts, to just garnish your plate and add a lot of texture and color. Right. Number six, I think this came from you, Brian. Think before you clank. We just went over alcohol and diabetes and what you should be doing to make sure you're um, – Staying healthy if you're having a cocktail or two and uh, enjoying the holiday season. So you want to make sure, if you have any questions about that, I think you referred people to WebMD for more information on that. Mm -hmm. Number five. Oh, this was from, this is actually my tip, that's why I'm on the picture. <laughs> <laughs> this 
does make a difference if you set the table. I used to work in the catering, several catering places actually, and uh, we would always dress up the table, and I think that may uh, make the difference as well. I mean, we're we're talking about. You don't want to feel deprived during the holidays. I did an outreach event last year. We were talking to women with diabetes about the holidays. Uh, most a lot. Of, at first, people had nothing to share, and then when they started to talk about it, a lot of women, because of their diabetes, did not engage in the holidays. So the idea here, and part of the, the goal of this webinar, was trying to talk about ways that you could be living with diabetes and also be the life of the party. So here's a great way to do that. Table, if you've ever been to a Diva Medica event, you know my mom and everyone uses ribbons, tablecloths, great china, makes it a festive occasion, and uh, allows you to stay on course and on track with your health goals and objectives. Now you make this special. Now I think Judy, you came back with uh, number four with a crudite because down in Florida you were telling me all about the power of veggies and how many veggies we have to get into our how many how many servings of veggies and fruits should someone have in a day? I would try to get at least five servings of fruits and vegetables. Or if you think of what you're trying to eat, um, like a serving is like a half a cup of cooked vegetables or a cup of raw vegetables. Or if you take your plate and you cut it in half, like half your plate should be veggies. They're low in calories. A whole cup of veggies is only like 25 calories. And instead of using chips, use veggies for dip. And they have a lot of color. They're really nice way to decorate with and, and really delicious. So. And now my good friend Dolores in Philadelphia wanted to ask, the carrots have a lot of sugar, Judy? Carrots are like any other vegetables, but they've got a bad reputation because they have a higher glycemic index. But actually, carrots are really healthy food. So They're if you wanted to find out about uh, the sugar content in carrots, you recommend The Calorie King? The Calorie King is, uh, is a really great book. It has a list of all of the different foods, whether they're processed, they're raw, or also the, um, the ADA um, website, the American Diabetes Association. They have a, a kind of like a guide you can use um, to, to uh, look. And if you, there's also an application, if you have an iPhone, it's called gotomeals.com. And you can add that onto your phone as an application, and it's the Calorie King book where you can have it with you all the time if you have, like, a mobile device. Great. Number three, make your own dip. Be healthy and quick. Make your own dip. That's pretty <laughs> basic, but it does I mean, seriously, you don't know what's in a store-bought uh, dip. You might as well do it on your own. You could substitute, as you said, a yogurt, even the light mayonnaise. You know, sour cream now comes in a variety of low fat, no fat, and you could make your own dip and play around with it. And as we were saying earlier, if it doesn't taste, uh, if you don't enjoy the taste, then you might want to add some herbs to it that you put in the freezer and incorporate some of the other tips. And if it still doesn't taste well, then set a spectacular table, put it out there and see how quickly it goes. <laughs> Number two, let's be real, everybody. Hi, Judy. I know Memorial Regional Hospital is going to start a garden. You're very much encouraging this. Mayor Bloomberg here in New York City has all the green markets for us. Uh, you know, that's a great way to stay healthy is to go to a farmer's market, see what's beautiful, colorful, and add that to your table. Especially now because it's the harvest season. We have so many, we have like so many beautiful colors that we can choose from as regarding produce and, and trying different fruits, vegetables. Try something new you never tried. And here's number one. Dun, da, da, da. Dun, da, da, da. Display a fabulous array. We, you just mentioned this earlier about get out of that chip and dip routine. If that's all you're used to serving, there's new things you could be trying. You mentioned tofu earlier. We could we haven't mentioned hummus, but there are a lot of great suggestions out there for ways to stay healthy and entertain that just kind of pull you a little bit off of what you were traditionally doing before. So instead of just doing the chips, with a dip, you might want to try. I love the idea of the salsa on different things now. I think that's a great idea. Like, get rid of the cheese. Why not try it? You know, that's going to be our next tip for the next round of healthy entertaining. So this is a great tip for everyone is just to try to break that habit and look up some, you know, play around. I mean, part of entertaining is experimenting and having fun. Right. I tried a great recipe with uh, tofu the other day with edamame salad. It was really great, and you could just take your chips and dip right into that with some salsa. It's got a lot of texture. It's colors. It's very entertaining. 
And you had a bonus tip for me, Judy, because one of our favorite holidays is right around the corner. It's Halloween. Uh, I love this. There's some great ways you can um, enjoy this. I, I totally get into costuming and decorations. I think that's the way to really celebrate the spirit without having the uh, carb fest with the candy. And I love your suggestions about have, giving away movie coupons, makeup, nail polish, uh, or coffee, flavored coffees. I think that's a great idea instead of putting out candy. I think people would enjoy that just as much as they would uh, the candy. And I, I know that the problem sometimes people face is at their office, people put out a big oh, candy yeah. ball. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> th you know, that's something that is a temptation for people. Do you have a tip about that, Judy, for people well, in well, the office? We do put some candy out in our office, and we, we will list the carbs on it. <laughs> we will put the carbs All on right, it. Well, that's not bad. If it's out there, maybe they should put the uh, information so people are aware aware of what they're eating. That might just stop them from being mindless and being more mindful. So that's and, not a bad suggestion. Yeah, just be mindful. And, and if you keep it to a small portion and trade it for something else that you would have in your usual day's intake of carbohydrates, then you'd probably be okay. All right. And now, surprise, surprise, uh, Brian, you didn't know we were going to go out to the Olive Garden today, but we are virtually going out to the Olive Garden with Judy Wilcox because, you know, when you go to the Olive Garden, Everyone's family. They have a tagline like that. So we're Everyone's all family. They've got the endless possible. There we go. Are we? They do now. Endless possible. That's awesome. We'll go in Times Square. The, you know, well, in New York, as you know, we have small apartments, so you can't really entertain at your house. A lot of times, you entertain out at a restaurant. So you know, this endless possible with this economy sounds like a good deal to me. I was curious with Judy, how would we get through uh, a night out at an Italian restaurant? We chose the Olive Garden. If you're in the chat with us right now, uh, I chose Olive Garden because our menu is available online, and you can look up an entree and send it into us as we're reviewing this with Judy. So your number one tip with going to the Olive Garden or to a pasta restaurant was creating a carbohydrate budget. How many how many carbohydrates should we have in a meal? You know, should we be aiming for to have in a meal, Judy? I think that if you, you know, just if you're just getting started, if you stuck to three choices or about 45 grams of carbohydrate, that's a good place to start. If you're a woman and if you're a man, probably 60 grams is a good place to begin. And, and if you think about a third of a cup of pasta as being um, one carbohydrate choice, that's about 15 grams. So you see where you go with the endless bowl. So what you have to decide is, what do I want to, how do I want to spend this budget? You know, do I want to spend it on pasta? Do I want to have some breadsticks? And, you know, so those are some of the things you might weigh out. And then you're, you were um, encouraging us actually in Hollywood, Florida to think small because the, I've been to the Olive Garden. These plates are ginormous. Yeah. They're family-sized plates. <laughs> I always ask for the salad plate which is probably about the same size as what a 10-inch plate is because the salad, all of our plates have gotten bigger, you know, where everybody, restaurants think big, we got to think smaller. So it's kind of a way to fool your eyes by using a smaller plate, and you can balance things out a little bit that way by um, having a smaller portion of what you like, and you can still include all the things you want. And, stay and then your budget. third tip was, you know, customizing the menu for your specific needs, right, and goals? Right. What I would say is, like, you know, instead of asking for the dressing on the salad, get the dressing on the side. If there's some kind of a, a sauce they put on the vegetables, maybe you just want to put it on the side of the vegetables and dip a little bit. You could always add more vegetables because if you think about it, that's something they have right on hand, you know, like chopped tomatoes or throw in some extra cucumbers or sometimes I just just put everything over lettuce. So it, it's just what you like to do, you know. So And by adding more vegetables, you're going to cut down the amount of uh, carbohydrates. Great. Play the numbers. I love this tip. So this is, uh, because there's so many menus available online, we could start looking at the numbers ahead of time, right, and see just how many calories are in that Alfredo sauce, which was frightening to me to find out that a bowl of their Alfredo was like 1,200 calories. Right, or the chicken Alfredo is 1,440 Why are you probably ate virtually first, Brian? Oh, <laughs> and 103 grams of carbs. So when we're thinking.
thinking about 45 grams of carbs at a meal, and that's not including the breadsticks or any of the other things, or if you did want to have a drink. So you might also look at maybe asking if you can order the lunch entree or ordering off a child's menu. So and, and planning ahead so you can make a choice. So like by viewing the menu, you're not there faced with what should I get, you know, and then tempted. And then we were talking, uh, you and I were talking the other day that some people don't, um, you know, it's hard to be on the fly trying to figure out the carbs. So you had this portion teller way of doing it, which was kind of like using your hand or using objects that you know in your daily activity could help you judge how much food you're actually eating. So using your hand, you said, was like a good guide to, to uh, a, you're looking at the palm of our hand and, and we're using it as a guide to indicate three to five ounces. Yeah, your hand could be about three to five ounces, the palm part of your hand. Or if you could also use like a deck of cards, that's also about three ounces. And if you ball your hand up into a fist, that's about the size of a cup. Or if you look at something like a large baseball or something, it's about three quarters of a cup, a golf ball, a quarter of a cup. And this is these are like real time things that we all know so that they're easy to keep in your mind because you're not going to walk around with a measuring cup. And, you know, it, and it's really realistic to use these things. Like a postage stamp is about the size of a teaspoon. So when you're looking at butter and margarine and you're scooping it out, you're, you're going, well, how much is that? Um, four small dice is about this, an ounce of cheese. And, you know, a lot of times what people do is they get their dressing on the side and they might get a whole pitcher of dressing and then pour it on there. What I suggest is just take your little fork and dip it right into the dressing and then dip it in your salad. You get a lot of flavor, but you cut down on the amount. So anything you can do to kind of measure and keep things in some control helps you to still have fun and still maintain um, your blood sugars. Have people, I know you, you work at the Nutrition Center down there in Hollywood, Florida, so are, do these tips really work for people? Have you had patients who've been able to go back out to restaurants and kind of enjoy their favorite menus again? Yes, because now people can, you, you know, it's not like everything you can't have. I can have what I like. I can have things that I enjoy, have them in small amounts. And when you start measuring, you'll start seeing that you're losing weight. And that's also quite a few people with diabetes are trying to lose weight. So by measuring, you're controlling portion size, you're controlling carbohydrates, you're doing a lot of things. And I think it's really motivating to be able to have a few things you like. Well, now we're going to wrap it up with proud of your pineapple, which is our way of dressing up fruits and vegetables so that you could stay healthy but still feel like a diva or a don. I would like to include the guys on this one. And uh, when we were in uh, Florida, you got to see my brother, Rich, again, uh, making some spectacular recipes. Unfortunately, the photos for these two recipes are going to be providing are not seen on this webinar. If you need me to send you the uh, directions or you want the recipes, just email me at mrdivabetic at gmail.com. The first thing we did, Judy, you were there to say yes or no, cucumber lollipops. I thought they were a huge hit. Uh, what Big it is, is you, anytime you put a vegetable on a stick, first of all, kids are going to eat it. And second of all, this one was great. You kind of take a cucumber, you slice it up, you wedge a cherry tomato inside that little cucumber slice, so now you have like a big bread center with a green outside, and you put it on a stick, and then it's very easy to dip this into some of your hummuses or low-fat um, uh, French onion dip, or I don't know, what's your favorite dip? Or salsa, I guess, Judy. We could yogurt. You could use yogurt dip. You could make like yogurt. You could actually mix yogurt and salsa. That's a great dip. Um, or or any seasoning and herbs. And these look really beautiful and colorful. And I love ricotta, ricotta cheese, ricotta, whatever you want to call it. I think that's oh, also yeah, a great thing. Yeah, ricotta cheese is also, it's really, it's, it, by adding more protein, it fills you up. So if you add a little protein into your dip, then it becomes you know, it's more fulfilling. It's not just all carbs and fat. Now, I love this. I do. I work for a kids program. I've done these Hawaiian pizza kebabs before. I've actually done them on TV. These are fabulous. This was a suggestion that we had um, from another educator. Judy and I both work with Jessica. It was, people love pizza. How do they get their pizza without all the calories? One way is just to eliminate the crust. And as Judy was saying earlier, fill up on the vegetables. So the Hawaiian pizza kebab, again, it's all on a stick. You're taking like those central items in a, in a Hawaiian pizza, which are pineapple, cheese, 
ham. We like to substitute uh, turkey and uh, tomato, and now serving it fresh. So I like to use uh, the matzo balls. I use pineapple chunks. I use green peppers, tomatoes, and then I use turkey instead of ham, because everyone in my family knows I don't enjoy that. Uh, and then I, I stack those. I, um, I alternate those on a, a skewer. I put a little low-sodium teriyaki. I said teriyaki sauce, but just a little low. And then I grill it. And then I pull them out, and they're sensational. And no one has ever, no one has ever missed a crust on these uh, pizza kebabs. Oh, those sound fabulous. <laughs> I want to grill them too much of the cheese. The you know your matzo balls turn into uh, butter, but you you just do it a little bit to get a little bit of color. You could also grill your vegetables ahead of time and serve it all cold with those keeping those uh, matzo balls in a uh, nice formation. So it just depends on how much you want to uh, set a spectacular table. Yeah, we're you can display at the them too. End like of our webinar, and uh, Judy Wilcox, I want to thank you for guesting on today's program. You're a registered dietitian, which and a certified diabetes educator out of out of Hollywood, Florida, and uh, um, uh, we were just down there a couple of weeks ago doing an outreach program. And always a pleasure to work with Brian. We have another webinar coming up for National Diabetes Awareness Month in November. Uh, we have a surprise topic because we're celebrating uh, raising awareness in World Diabetes Day. So tune in, uh, look at divabeg.org or go to Clinic Labs to find out the date and time on that. I believe it's November, I want to say it's November 9th. I could be wrong. That sounds about right. Uh, November 9th, maybe November 7th. And if you have any questions or want any further comments for any of us, you can always email me at mrdivabeg at gmail.com or email clinilabs.com. Uh, you can just go to our website, uh, www.clinolab.com, uh, and click on Participate, and uh, that will give you our email address. And thanks for having me um, as a guest, Max. It was really fun to share my information with everyone. Thank okay. you. I think you did great, Judy. Way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, remember, you can catch Judy and I on the Diva Bear Talk Radio. Just go to divabear.org, and we've got a couple more radio shows coming up next month. So uh, I think we're going to go to the Red Lobster, Judy. Oh, boy. We'll never get some of those great cheese biscuits, Max. I wonder how much fat is in those. <laughs> Have a bite. One bite. All right, everybody. Thank you for being on this, uh, this month's webinar. Bye, Max. Bye-bye.